All right, everyone. If you were following instructions, what you should have done is uh, read this document about poor young Elizabeth Bentley and her struggles uh, during the Industrial Revolution and trying to make a living and what happened to her eventually. Okay. And uh, what I want to be able to do is to go through uh, some of the questions that you have already answered. Hopefully, you've done numbers one through four already. Okay. And so if we're going to set the stage for a, a lecture called the excesses of the Industrial Revolution, okay, we have to be able to examine uh, some of the uh, context for this particular uh, time period. Okay. And so uh, the first question asks you the historical and the geographical setting of this document, something you're asked to do uh, for all of the essays. So in that, okay, we have obviously the uh, Industrial Revolution okay, and the uh, the new machinery, the new ability for mankind to be able to produce like never before, okay? but yet at the exact same time, okay, those notions of uh, individual liberties and freedoms okay, and the ability for the individual to improve himself outside of the traditional class struggles okay, um, of the old European uh, notions, that's all being challenged as well in the mid-19th century. Okay? All of this eventually is going to lead to Okay. The rise of Western Europe okay, and how the uh, Europeans are going to conquer and possess and control okay, most of the world by the end of the century. So by 1900, okay, the world is a Western, particularly European and American uh, possession. So that itself is the historical and geographical setting okay, for uh, this particular uh, lecture, but then also this particular unit as well. Okay. But it's not, as you saw in the document, all rosy and happy. Okay? In fact, there are a number of uh, negative consequences to come out of the Industrial Revolution. Yesterday's task and examine some of the working conditions should demonstrate this as well. Okay? So we're going to examine some consequences, some of the economic ideologies that come about as a result of the Industrial Revolution and some social and political consequences as such. Um, in the introduction yesterday, I showed a slide, um, an Im image from a, a Curier and Ives uh, lithograph. So Curier and Ives is a, uh, in a, a corporation that sells goods and so forth. And so um, they oftentimes will have magazines or others um, to um, highlight their goods. Uh, and this uh, illustration is a lithograph. This is a basically a, uh, an ink blotted uh, image that gets reproduced here. And this is called the progress of the century here. Okay. And uh, it really does highlight the, again, the growth of uh, industry. Okay? If you could just uh, utilize your own independent thoughts, your own independent efforts, using the technology at hand, uh, you are able to therefore create a society that is going to uh, produce more items, make uh, living conditions better. Uh, and not only that, um, but what they believe really improve countries um, and people groups as a whole. Okay? And the part of this push of individualism is the birth of the notion of if you allow for human beings okay, using their own effort to work as hard as they can um, and to put as little limitations as possible, then they will do much, much better. And so there's this push for an economic policy called capitalism, or what uh, many would call laissez-faire economics. In other words, laissez-faire meaning, okay, uh, let it be, just let it, um, just let whatever happens, happens. Okay? Uh, so in other words, intervene as little as possible. So there's the push uh, away from an economic type of economic policy that we looked at previously uh, called mercantilism. Okay, and mercantilism here where states will intervene um, in the nature of trade, raising tariffs when ne necessary, uh, making laws whereby uh, ships would have to dock at your own port, uh, taxes would be uh, taken from goods that you're trying to export to other countries, all to try to keep as much wealth as possible inside the country as possible. But what it does is it produces limitations on who you can trade with. Okay. Um, and therefore restrict the ability of individuals to do um, their best. And okay. so advocates of laissez-faire economics or capitalist policies are calling for greater free trade. Okay. And not only that, but okay, following the laws of supply and demand. Okay. It's not something you can 
uh, naturally produce. People want things, people want to buy things, and things just happen. And so as a result of this, hey, uh, the policy should be we should just let this happen. If there is a, a high demand a, for a particular good, a, prices are going to go up. A, if there is an enormous supply, a, prices are going to go down. A, so in other words, a, uh, depending on supply and demand, prices and quantities, all that will shift a, based on needs and wants. A, furthermore, a, and probably one of the most important is that a competition a, will drive innovation. Right? Obviously, this image is a little bit on the older side now. Hey, but think about your cell phones, right? Every single year, right? Samsung and Apple will have to figure out uh, new um, cell phones for you to purchase and try to make theirs as um, best as possible. I mean, now how many cameras do you have on your phone for crying out loud, right? But every year, hey, you have to be able to drive innovation because otherwise you're not going to uh, survive as a company. But what it does as society as a whole is that things get better. You get more stuff. You have uh, more uh, effectiveness to do things because the technology increases and so forth. Hey, much of this is espoused by the one of the early economists, a man by the name of Adam Smith. In his book, The Wealth of Nations, he advocates for what uh, many would call sort of the invisible hand of the market. And so he uses some imagery here, hey, whereby hey, look, people are going to want things. They are going to desire things um, as is. And so it's not something that you can necessarily predict. Okay? And so therefore, if there is something that people want to see happen, and people will purchase it, they'll pay for this as is. So you can even things like uh, uh, environmental policy, right? If people want to preserve the environment, then they will go ahead and pursue this by purchasing uh, uh, recycled products okay, or uh, electric cars and so forth, right? So you don't have to necessarily create environmental laws. Okay? Supply and demand will okay, uh, cope with that particular issue. But unfortunately for Mr. Smith, if that does happen at all, okay, there's a price to pay be paid in between. Okay? And you see this in the Elizabeth Bentley document. And so if you review some of the questions that you've answered, particularly number two, think about the experiences of Elizabeth Bentley okay, and others just like her okay, in similar circumstances and thousands, if not millions, others as well <clears throat> who will suffer as a result of the growth of industry, that the working conditions, which you saw from our previous activity, were never, ever very good. And very frequently, these people would be exploited because, look, if they got hurt, Hey, who's going to pay for them? Who's going to pay for health care? No one. If you hurt your arm, well, guess what? You're going to get fired. Hey, and so hey, supply and demand, uh, because there's such a large supply of labor, all of a sudden now, the employers have absolutely no incentive hey, to pay for your health. Okay. And so as a result of this, there are many who called for dramatic reforms and changes uh, in ideology because in, in, inevitably, uh, competition is unfair, uh, it is unjust, and it's going to create worlds of inequalities uh, that would occur. And so there are those who decided, hey, maybe there is a way for us to try to figure this out. Uh, um, very early on in the early part of the Industrial Revolution, there are those who advocated for the creation of uh, using logic and reason and science. So in other words, look, uh, let's plan out our industries, not just the industry itself, but uh, a way for workers to live communally, to be able to uh, come together and, and work together, to live together without this notion of exploitation. So there was a few attempts to do this, the most famous of which was uh, Robert Owen's uh, New Harmony, uh, which, uh, was actually created in Indiana, where they tried to establish a, in a factory system um, with uh, common ownership of property and other ideas like the abolishment of religion and others and so forth here. Okay? But the notion is that everyone comes together okay, to try to create a better industrial society by the notion of planning. And these ideas will take off in other directions later on. Many of these utopian socialist societies don't function. They don't work out. I mean, they utilize strange ideas like uh, common marriage, if you want to figure out what that means, um, or uh, trying to create um, uh, new opportunities to be able to come together as sort of one large family. But either way, uh, it doesn't function. It doesn't work out as well. 
And part of why it might not work that comes from the theories of Marx uh, and Engels. Okay? Two Germans who actually uh, examined this particular time period and said, look, okay, from our observations, okay, the world will always be divided between the haves and the have-nots, okay? the uh, owners and the workers. And the terms that they used were this, the bourgeois or the bourgeoisie, Okay. what we've used as the middle class. But uh, for Marx and Engels, this is now okay, those who possessed um, the property, okay, the, the means of production. That's the bourgeois. Okay? Uh, and then the proletariat, okay, the working class. They, all these hundreds of thousands of people who now have moved into cities to work in these factories um, or anything associated with the Industrial Revolution who are being exploited okay, by those who own the factors of production. Okay? And so as a result of this, okay, Marx and Engels believe that the only way okay, democracy would stand, even democracies might be vulnerable to the bourgeois in terms of buying off elections and so forth. And so therefore, the only way okay, whereby the working class can ever okay, make life better for themselves <clears throat> is to uh, revolt. Okay? So they come together as a unified class okay, and uh, therefore overthrow the owners of the factors of production to seize power to take over. And then from there, once they seize possession of the government, they're going to start to change the notions of society, particularly when it comes to property and property ownership. Who should own property? Everyone. Okay? Every, as much as possible should be the public good. Okay? And as this progresses over time, because now you're trying to take a society okay, that whereby there's private ownership and you're going to move it along such that everything becomes public, it's going to take some time. And so over time, as the workers okay, start to shift society in this direction here, once it reaches okay, this state of utopia, perfection, this is what they call communism. Sounds good? Depends on how you see it. Okay, so with that, okay, Marx and Engels believe that this will happen in true industrial societies. This is the natural stage of events where it would happen. And so therefore, we should have communism in the United States, Germany, Britain. Instead, as it turns out, it was in two very unlikely places or several unlikely places, what will become known as the Soviet Union okay, or Russia, okay, and uh, particularly China as well. And as a result of this, which we'll get to later on okay, in the curriculum, okay, the fact that you have these non-industrial or uh, weak industrial states becoming the communist states, communism will have a different okay, uh, characteristic than Marx and Engels initially uh, had hoped it would be. Okay. So with that in mind here, okay, what we want to take a look at is to come back to the testimony on child labor in Britain here and be able to now uh, answer number four, okay, to be able to source uh, the document in terms of either explain the historical context, the point of view, the purpose for a particular audience, and the historical significance. I want to focus on particularly okay, the uh, one of the easier ways to be able to address and source a document. And that's to be able to look at the context okay, of this particular document. Okay. So first of all, if you didn't get four, let's, let me go ahead and ask a few questions for you. One, okay, where is this document taking place? Okay, where is it taking place? Think about that for a second. Hopefully, you pointed out that this is all, again, in a... Uh, parliamentary committee okay so there it is right now so you have this testimony a okay, by elizabeth bentley okay, and it is before this uh, parliamentary committee whereby she's talking about what's wrong with her life what's wrong with the industrial society as a whole here okay, and so as it turns out okay, because of this it's important for us to note okay, that her I, her struggles okay, um, don't go unseen in other words, okay, she does. She's not erased from history just like that. And instead, okay, her ideas are now here in a legislative chamber, hoping that okay, this will alter and change political policy. 
Okay, and so as a result of this, instead of a communist revolution, again, context matters here. Okay, where she's suffering, okay, plays a role because she is in a place whereby okay, there's a chance, okay, at least for the future, that she might have struggled and her life might come to nothing. Okay, but okay, her successors, the people who are working in the factories in the decades okay, uh, soon after, will in, have to endure. Yes, but may get a better life as a result of uh, this particular testimony. Okay? And so instead of a communist revolution in many of these places, you have instead okay, the working class actively pushing to create unions, okay? actively trying to create a, a way for them to uh, establish some kind of pull with the government because now they do have a say in these democracies. And so as a result of this, to be able to uh, vouch for their own interests okay? and to get laws Okay. Like in the case of Elizabeth Bentley, you can imagine things like child labor laws okay, that are being established. Okay. So what we see in places like Britain, the United States, France, okay, where there is okay, a way to uh, express your interests, okay, rather than revolution, there's at least an outlet, right? You can imagine like it's this balloon, right? This imagery of a balloon. You keep blowing up that balloon okay, and yes, things are going to get worse, but this means that you're releasing some of that air, some of that tension, and there is some active change such that you don't get an explosion that leads to a revolution like you see elsewhere. Okay? Many of these working class uh, groups will form labor unions, and if they're able to come together, and this is always a challenge, and it's going to take decades for them to secure these things, they're going to eventually, through the process of stopping work and these strikes, secure rights for themselves and also not only that but subsequent future generations and in a lot of ways we are the beneficiaries of some of the things that they're able to do including one the securing of higher wages right there are minimum wage laws that um, are enacted today the shorter work day okay, for us okay, 40 hours a week after that you get overtime when you contrast this with uh, many who in the 19th century working up to 50 60 70 hours a week uh, depending on the amount of sunlight um, is provided uh, safety regulations you saw some of these working conditions from the previous assignment that hey, uh, things weren't safe not at all okay? the creation of old age pension okay? uh, employee insurance Okay. Um, health insurance, things like that, that is essential that people are pushing for uh, all across the globe. Okay. And much of this is done and secured by these left-leaning uh, political parties okay. who now have a place okay, in, um, in the legislatures as well. Okay. So the working class being able to establish these labor unions helps to relieve some of that pressure. And with that in mind, Okay. What you want to do with the last question is to take a look at this document, which we will evaluate later on, okay, um, on a case in Russia. Okay. So utilize the SOAPS method to go ahead and evaluate this document. It's a good chance we might review this later on, but this is a good time to pause the video, go ahead and read this document, and for number five, use the SOAPS method to evaluate this document. So again, hit pause, evaluate this document. All right, guys, welcome back. Again, I'll take a look at some of your samples and we'll review that at a later time. But we wanna finish off this particular lecture here okay, in examining some of the other class groups uh, in this particular time period, particularly the rise of the middle class. Okay? With the growth of the Industrial Revolution, okay, whether they are doctors, bureaucrats, okay, investors, um, teachers, uh, professors, and others, but there is a growing middle class um, that comes out of the economic growth of the Industrial Revolution. Okay? And this is the group that okay, not only won political liberalization for themselves, and by political liberalization being um, uh, equally greater equality in terms of access to government and po uh, government policies and legislatures and so forth, okay, rights such as suffrage, the right to vote, okay, equality rights, okay, these individuals playing a key role in the new democratic legislatures will help to pass many of the reform laws that we see in the late 19th and early 20th centuries as well. Okay, we've seen this group early on 
in the French and the American revolutions, and they will continue to play a role uh, in subsequent reform, uh, not just in terms of law, but then also uh, on their own as well, whereby you have groups, especially uh, uh, married women, who is again, whose role is in the home, uh, but will have more free time on their hands than ever before. Uh, um, and so they're going to create uh, programs of public education. Uh, many young women will become public school teachers as a result of this. Um, they will be a part of the abolitionist movement uh, of uh, slavery, particularly in Britain and the United States. Uh, and they're going to uh, fight to create better urban living conditions for the working poor as well. Uh, a good example of this is a whole house uh, in Chicago, whereby it's sort of like a what they call a halfway house, allowing immigrants and others who are poor a place to stay temporarily to get kind of get their on their feet and to um, adjust to American society and so forth. So again, either way, um, the middle class is going to help in some ways. Again, it's not um, they're not going to fix everything, but they're going to play a role in reforming society because they have more money, time, uh, and the heart to be able to do this as well. And many of the women who were a part of these organizations are going to find themselves wondering, look, we're fighting for equality, freedom, uh, greater rights for uh, many of these families, and particularly men of other ethnic, religious, racial groups. But they still find themselves okay, with major legal and religious limitations. Okay? And so as a result of this, the role of women changes okay, as they enter in to both the workforce and also in the uh, re various reform societies. Okay? Albeit most of them are still going to uh, be challenged by the ideas of the Victorian age. Again, this is a, a British cultural phenomena that uh, you can say eventually will extend out most of the Western world. Okay? But the Victorian age meant that there should be separate spheres. Okay? In other words, okay, it, the role of uh, the public role, okay, okay, work, Okay, politics and the such belong to uh, men, okay, and uh, they are in control of uh, okay, and represent the family outside the home. Within the realm of the home, okay, women will conduct affairs. Okay, and so these are distinctly separate. Both have their roles, and that is that. So that's the Victorian age where there are ex expectations on both ends of what they are supposed to do. Okay? But with many women, they're starting to become uh, quite educated. Okay? Many women's colleges will, uh, are created at this time. Okay? More of them are literate. There are key um, poets and writers who are women uh, in the uh, 19th century. Okay? And as a result of this, they're going to make a push not just for um, rights for other groups, but especially for themselves in trying to earn the vote as well. Okay? And over time, Okay, by the early 20th century, they are successful in doing so. And the end result is that many of the uh, democracies grow. Okay? Early democracies, the Britain, the, Uni uh, the United States, uh, France, and others, okay, they are going to start to see greater uh, political involvement okay, of all different types of groups of people. Okay? An example of this are constitutional monarchies that we saw um, in a few of the uh, lessons earlier in the French and the American revolutions, okay? royals sharing power with elected assemblies, okay? whereby in these democracies, they are all subject to written law. Okay? And uh, again, in, by the 19th and early 20th century, you have a number of uh, laws that are passed that will allow for more and more people the ability to vote. The Reform Acts of Britain in 1832 uh, will extend the vote out further okay? and uh, uh, allow for uh, greater suffrage, eliminating the uh, requirements of the vote okay, where previously you needed to own property, you need to have a certain amount of wealth, okay? um, you must be a man. All of these things are starting to go away. Okay? But not that the whole world will become a democracy. You get, however, in these key states here, okay, uh, the establishment of more democratic institutions. Okay? But Okay, for most of the world, okay, things are still difficult. Okay, and you may not get access because you're not a citizen of these Western-style countries. Okay? Um, and so uh, many of people across the world are now either continuing to live in these subsistence farms or they are now what we call these wage laborers of the industrial world. Okay? 
And uh, part of why a, probably the most pre uh, prevalent form of a, uh, of labor in the world is the wage labor is the eventual abolition and decline of slavery as a whole. Okay, both in terms of one the the more the morality of owning another human being, but then also for many the cost. If now all of a sudden now uh, you can get people from all over the globe to come to you and work at enormously low wages, okay, why have to pay for someone's housing and food and so forth here? Okay? And so the combination of both okay, the American Civil Wars and so forth will lead to the abolition of slavery. Okay? Um, serfdom, which has been on the decline since the Black Death, okay, uh, is uh, now uh, much, much more inefficient, especially for those large manors that could not now compete with industrial size farming. And so serfdom, which is already an inefficient means of creating agricultural production, okay, eventually will uh, lose its status. Okay, and uh, through that and a number of rebellions uh, will lead to the end of serfdom across the world. Okay? And so as a result of this, okay, the wage laborer, the ability to say, look, I am going to people are going to go where they can find work will become the norm by the 20th century, okay, whereby millions and millions of people are now on the move for the first time in human history. Okay, a real true globalization of people going across the world. And we're going to have an activity on this one later on here okay, and the effects of not just simply okay, the uh, uh, new workers in cities and making changes in these new societies. But what happens as it, millions of people are on the march and on the move across the world? Okay, but we'll take a look at that at another time. All right, guys, have a good one.